than number two. And all of a sudden, number one pulls down, but doesn't pull down as far. Can everybody see that? Let's think about that for a moment. So I've already had people try to analyze these waveforms without any other prerequisites. Okay. Again, I told you I always like to do a relative compression test to determine which cylinder is suspect before I get started on this, and here's why. If cylinder number one's exhaust valve is leaking, it's not sealing right, when cylinder number one starts to descend and pull on the intake manifold, isn't some of that pull shared with the exhaust system? And if that's the case, is the pull going to be as deep? It won't. So, in other words, a faulty ex sealing exhaust valve for cylinder number one could cause this waveform, couldn't it? I'll show you another possibility. What if I told you the problem was number five? If number five had a leaky intake valve, we go up for number five's compression event, third one up from the bottom, top dead center. So if number five's leaking intake valve could cause this, doesn't it make better sense if I had a relative compression trace first, they already know which one's at fault? Hmm. That's what I'm talking about. This waveform, any of those waveforms could be caused by multiple problems on different cylinders. So no one can look at this and tell you for sure it's definitely a bad intake valve for cylinder number five, or it's definitely a bad exhaust valve for cylinder number one, because either one of those could cause a similar waveform. Does that make sense? But my relative compression trace already told me cylinder number five is my dead hole. Doesn't it kind of rule out the possibility of an exhaust valve for cylinder number one? That's the way I use it. It's a technique to help rule out what's wrong, excuse me, what can't be at fault, and leave what, what, what is, uh, what's left. So, I want to remind everybody, yes, this is... ...heavy Equinox with a 2.4 liter. Now, when I received this car, the customer had brought it into us, had about 80,000 miles on it, and he told me the car was running absolutely fine yesterday. And he got in the car this morning and he started it up and he was driving down the road. And again, it ran just fine. But very slowly, there, or very shortly thereafter, it started to run funny. And then it started making noise and then it ran worse. And then it started making more noise and then it got to the point where he could barely drive it. And that's when he limped it into our driveway and he said it started smelling really bad. So um, I get in it and hit the key and all I can hear is absolute carnage. Like it made you want to... Yeah, ugh, something's broken. There's oil everywhere. It sounded like the rod came through the block, and this, this engine was just done. I do want to mention it was minus 18 with the wind chill that day. <laughs> so we were really slow, and I decided to push the car into the bay, not to see if we could fix it. I just wanted to mess around with the pressure transducers because I had nothing else going on. That's what I did. So just for research, I did a cranking in cylinder for one of the four cylinders. In this case, I chose cylinder number one. I did a cranking intake waveform at the PCV valve, and I did a cranking crankcase pressure waveform from the dipstick tube, and this is set up here. And when I walked over here and I pulled the air box snorkel out and went to pick it up, I got a bath, soaking wet with water. What the hell? But the air filter was dry. I thought maybe he inhaled a puddle and kind of like hydrolocked the engine and bent a rod or knocked the bearing out. but. The air filter was dry, so I thought that was kind of weird. Where the hell did the water come from? Where my French? But just keep that in the back of your head. So I put the car up in the air. Actually, before I did that, I'm looking at this waveform. And we have got a whopping 1.8 PSI of compression. However, more importantly, look at the pocket differential. Here's the intake pocket. Here's the exhaust pocket. There's a 13 PSI difference. Remember I said two to three PSI difference? 13, a huge difference here. Meaning what about the cylinder's ability to seal? Or excuse me, meaning what about cylinder leakage? Significant amount, right? And although small, don't those towers do this? They're all leaning. So I start analyzing this waveform trying to figure out where this compression is going. And I notice a few things. One, look at this exhaust valve. Doesn't it pop open? Then I get over here, and I see this intake pocket pulled down, and then all of a sudden it disappears. So at this point in time, this was the first time I ever took notice of this characteristic, and I didn't really know, honestly, I didn't know what it was. But I figured it out in the end, and I'll show you how. 
I come over here where my intake valve closes. Now, if you refer back to your notes, that soft spec I gave you, 55 to 60 degrees after bottom dead center. Well, here's 30, here's 60, here's 90, here's 120, here's 150 degrees. It's about 170 degrees later. This, this cam jumped like 180 degrees. Really, really, really far. So then I got to thinking, wait a minute. If this represents 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation, and it's supposed to close at not 90, but maybe 60. Is that fair enough? Watch this. This is where the intake valve closes. This is all compression right here, isn't it? So what happens if it doesn't close at 60, or 90, or 120, or 150, but maybe at about 170? How much pressure can I build there? I don't know. 2 PSI, right? <laughs> So that explains this. Now watch what happens. I build the two PSI, right? Then I go down on what? Expansion. Watch this. What am I building in the cylinder right now? Vacuum. Vacuum until what happens? What happened right there? So now everything's coming together. I'm like, son of a gun. Gotten already. Eight spark plugs and eight coils, a PCM, and an engine harness. When that didn't fix it, it got a cylinder head. Ready for this? When that didn't fix it, it got an engine. And it still ain't fixed. Still misfire. So a good friend of mine, Dave Wagner, who by the way was one of the masterminds behind Super Saturday. You guys are familiar with that event near Philly? Phenomenal event. I recommend you make your way down there next year. It's only going to get bigger. One of the best events on the East Coast. He's one of the masterminds. But once Dave called me on the phone and told me about this, I said, you've got to let me have his case study. I want to put it in his class because it's a really good example. So Dave gets called into this shop. Actually, I can't even remember if this came into his shop or he was called out. Did it come into his shop? It came into his shop and he was issued this job. So he knows a misfire can be due to lack of engine integrity, meaning it can't breathe or it can't seal. He knows it could be due to a lack of proper air fuel ratio or even a poor spark. So he's going to pursue it just like anybody would logically. He's going to evaluate the easy stuff first and move into the more difficult to grab information. So he does a relative compression test first and foremost. Do you see anything wrong, relatively speaking, from one cylinder to the next? There's some variations, but nothing that stands out as this is the reason number three is misfiring, right? So he moves on. Does not immediately assume it's an engine mechanical fault. <clears throat> so he moves on to ignition. Why ignition? Because this is a two-wire Ford cop system, and just like me, Dave's comfortable with analyzing ignition waveforms, so he's looking at primary ignition to see if he could see anything uh, in the waveform result, uh, causing a result of a misfire. And it's very hard to see, probably on camera too, but the green trace here is ignition coil current. And we can see it's exhibiting what I would consider normal characteristics for a multi-strike system. But more importantly, which is even more telling, is we see that the primary ignition voltage exceeds 100 volts, which equates to about 10 kV, which is quite normal at idle on a vehicle with decent compression. But also we have a relatively decent length burn line, just about a millisecond or more, and a nice nose at the end. Does anybody see anything wrong with this ignition event? I certainly don't. And neither did Dave, so he moved on. If it's not the engine and it's not ignition, what must it be? Fuel. So he moves on to fuel. He sees a really good pull down here for uh, a fuel injector voltage for, for number three. Pulls darn close to ground. He sees current flow start to build, just about an amp. A nice pinnel bump about halfway up. He sees a good inductive kick that's clipped at about 60 volts. And also he sees a closing pinnel bump. For all intents and purposes, that injector is opening, right? It doesn't mean fuel got in the cylinder, did it? But wouldn't he have scan data to support a lack of fueling for one cylinder? Wouldn't fuel trim be through the roof for that one bank if he had an injector that wasn't flowing fuel? So by way of the data he has coming at him through the DLC, he knows this cylinder is being fueled properly. So then he realizes he ran out of easy stuff to check. Right? Remember the three funnels? He breezed past all three funnels. But he didn't make the mistake that all the other shops made. He didn't get to throw in parts. He stopped and he reevaluated the situation. He said, I've done all the tests that should have told me what's wrong with this car. 
and I still don't know. I have no sense of direction. So he decided to reevaluate everything he did. What does the relative compression test tell us? Someone seals. Yeah, it infers its cylinder's ability to seal because of the starter though, right? Does it say anything about how the cylinder breathes? When's a misfire occur? When a car's running, right? Not when we're cranking. So he decides to go in the cylinder with a pressure transducer and look at cylinder number three through the eyes of the pressure transducer when it's moving air, when it's pumping air like it should be evaluated. That's the one thing he didn't do. He assumed he ruled out engine mechanical, and now he realizes he didn't. He ruled out just the cylinder's ability to seal. 